Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. Apologies for the voice as I am struggling with a little bit of a cold, but I did want to get this video out there. A video on this mystery PC that I picked up in a lot of other PCs. So in this video we're going to be exploring what's inside this machine and what we can do with it. So in this video we're going to be looking at the internals of the machine. Look at the components like the CPU, the motherboard, and the video card. Look at the BIOS of the computer. Install some software, run some benchmarks, and play some games. So as you can see, it's one of those typical beige ATX style cases. It's a pretty early ATX style PC, judging by the cover, which can be removed in one uh, shot so it doesn't have these uh, standalone side panels so that makes me think that it's a little bit older than your typical ATX machine and if we look at the back of the PC we can also see that we have no onboard audio so we just have the keyboard mouse connector two USB ports two serial ports and a parallel port we have a uh, separate video card sound card and networking card so time to open her up and to open up the machine it's pretty much like an AT style machine there are no side panels that you usually see on ATX style machines and you can immediately see that this is a slot one uh, architecture so hidden beneath the power supply we have the CPU we have a video card some expansion cards here we have a CD-ROM drive a hard drive and if we move it to the side a little bit you can kind of see the slot one CPU sitting there behind the power supply so let's start her up because I think, you know, I'm not expecting any big bangs and it's starting up as an Intel Pentium 3 running at 333 megahertz, which is a bit odd because I don't think there is such a thing as a Pentium 3 running at 333 megahertz. But during the last boot up, the system hung for improper frequency combination. So we need to set the proper frequency now i don't know what the proper frequency is because i have no idea what kind of cpu we have in here so i'm just going to leave it by default and see if we can get the machine to boot so yeah after saving the changes let's reboot the pc and again we see that it's being picked up as an intel pentium 3 running at 333 megahertz with 320 megabytes of ram we have the award plug and play BIOS. We have a hard drive and a CD-ROM drive. We also seem to be having an Ultra 66 card in there. And finally, it does appear to boot and it's booting into Microsoft Windows XP, which is a bit odd for an Intel Pentium 3. But it is booting into the Windows XP desktop just fine. So while we're there, let's take a quick peek here. It's a Dutch version. So let's go into my computer properties. Let's see if we can find the device manager here somewhere under hardware. And let's see what kind of hardware Windows XP has detected. So let's start with the video card, NVIDIA GeForce 2 Ti, which is not bad. We have a creative PCI sound card, we have a Realtek networking card, and that's basically it, I think. So yeah, quick look at the exterior of the case. It is a bit yellowed, as you can see, judging by the disk drive, but overall a pretty nice looking case. On the back, we have the power supply, keyboard mouse connector, two USB ports, two serial ports, one parallel port, no onboard audio. We do have a separate video card here with the TV out. We have a sound card and a networking card. So let's open up the computer and see what we have inside. Now, in order to get into the expansion cards, we need to remove this little bracket here. There are a couple of screws here which hold this, this fan holder in place. I'm gonna be removing that. And then we can access the expansion cards. So first up is this hidden one here, which is an Ultra 66 uh, PCI card, allowing you to uh, add some additional uh, hard drives. So as you can see, we have two additional IDE connectors on this card. Next card that we have is the sound card. So still hooked up to the optical drive here. And this is a creative uh, Sound Blaster PCI card CT4810. 
then video card and this is the star of the show as far as i'm concerned because this is a geforce 200 ti card so this is not your standard mx card which was kind of the low-end card but this is definitely a high-end offering from nvidia the geforce 2 ti with the active cooler so a very nice find for a system like this and then finally the networking card from Realtek, PCI based. So yeah, always handy to have a networking card in a computer like this because you know this one doesn't have onboard networking, so we need a separate card for that. So let's take a look at the motherboard. So it's mounted onto this little side panel here that can be removed like so. There are a lot of cables coming from the case itself for the power button, reset button, and all of the LEDs. So it's always nice to you know, take stock of, of how everything is connected here, uh, just in case you wouldn't be able to find the manual of the motherboard, although usually that's not really a big problem. And the motherboard is an Asus P3BF, which was the successor of the very popular P2B mainboard from Asus. Now this is a Pentium 3 optimized motherboard. So we obviously have the slot one here where we can insert a Pentium 3 CPU, although obviously backwards compatible with Pentium 2. So this is one of those cartridge style CPUs. They're not the easiest one to insert into this slot one, but they do look really cool and they really give out this kind of Pentium 2, Pentium 3 feeling. Now this one is a 500 megahertz Pentium 3 with 512 kilobytes of cache running at a front side bus speed of 100 megahertz. It has the Cooler Master Cooler attached to it here. So yeah, really nice CPU. As far as chipset is concerned, we are rocking the Intel 44BX chipset, which is a very popular, stable and performant chipset from Intel. We have a very standard I.O. panel here, so keyboard, mouse, USB, serial parallel port, that's it. No onboard audio, no onboard networking. Capacitors on this board are in excellent condition. I can guarantee you if this were an Athlon board from a couple of years later, you would see a dried out caps all over the place, which is not the case here, luckily. We have four DIMM sockets here, so we can have up to one gigabyte of RAM on this computer. Now, I personally think that 128 megabytes should be sufficient for a system like this. Moving along, we have the standard ID connectors for the hard drive and the floppy disk. We have this dip switch block here, which allows you to configure the CPU either through these dip switches or through the BIOS. If you're going to be using dip switches uh, on the silk screen of the motherboard, you have all of the available settings for CPU frequency ratios, stuff like that. So if you are using the BIOS to configure the CPU, you just need to put the dip switches into position zero. And if not, you can use this little table here to determine what your front side frequency should be, what your CPU ratio should be, what your PCI bus ratio should be. So all of that can be configured here. Now this motherboard has one ISA slot, as you can see here and has six PCI slots, which was a lot for back in the day. I mean, there were variants of this motherboard that gave you five PCI slots and two ISA slots. As one can imagine in 1999, it was probably preferable to have more PCI slots than it was to have ISA slots. Next up, we obviously also have an AGP slot for the video. And we even still have the warranty sticker here. So this was probably sold on Tuesday, the 29th of February in the year 2000. Now, this was one of the first motherboards that came with the award medallion 6.0 BIOS, allowing you to change the CPU bus and PCI frequency in the BIOS. You also had the option to use these dip switches on the motherboard to do your configuration but having the ability to do the same using the BIOS 
made it a lot more convenient for overclockers without having to constantly open up the machine and figuring out what kind of dip switches we needed to change. And just look at the different CPU bus frequencies that we can set up here, as well as different PCI frequencies if you had these sensitive PCI devices that wouldn't go beyond the 33 megahertz. Now, as far as expansion cards are concerned, we have the Sound Blaster Live here, a PCI sound card, which is, you know, fairly compatible with Windows 98 and also MS-DOS. This is a CT4810. So this will do just fine. In the networking department, we have a Realtek networking card. Also, this is a very popular brand, very good driver support across different operating systems. So yeah, definitely a nice networking card to have. Now, because the motherboard itself doesn't support Ultra 66, I imagine the original owner added this PCI card in order to add some Ultra 66 devices in order to improve the, the overall you know, performance of the discs. But nothing was attached to it, so not really sure for what it was used. And here we have the graphics card, which is a GeForce 2 Ti. So it's kind of a high-end model of the GeForce 2 series. It's kind of comparable with a Radeon 7500. So an excellent card to have in a Pentium 3 system. It has good driver support. The caps look really good on this card. Uh, it was running really well. It can use these kind of low version NVIDIA drivers also in Windows 98, despite the fact that this is a more recent card. This is a card from 2001. So it's a little bit too modern for the Pentium 3, but yeah, I think it's a really good combination as we will see later on. Now, as I was planning to replace Windows XP with Windows 98, I decided to boot with the Windows 98 CD-ROM and go through the procedure of installing Windows 98, which also involves formatting the hard drive. Now, everything was going fine until all of a sudden when I came back to the PC, I noted it was looking like this, which is definitely not normal. So I put it into diagnostic mode, meaning I just put it down to its side, reseeded all of the cards and went ahead with the installation and then everything went fine. So I installed Windows 98, which is basically pretty straightforward, not going to show everything here. But the computer went through the installation just fine. There weren't any hangs, there weren't any freezes, no blue screens, nothing, no weird artifacts. Everything was running fine, so I assumed that this was just a one-off thing. Well, fine up until the point when I started to insert my USB thumb drive at the back when all of a sudden the desktop started looking like this. Again, this kind of weird graphical glitch and perhaps it's due to the fact that something was making a short or something wasn't properly seated. I have really no idea what caused this. Now what I did notice after a reboot is that the hardware monitor found an error and as I was entering the BIOS and went into the hardware monitor, I noticed that the 12 volt rail was showing a particularly low voltage, 10.8 or 10.5 volts, which is definitely below the required 12 volts. And to make matters worse, all of a sudden the computer started sounding like this. Now, I'm not an expert in ACES beep codes, but this doesn't sound good. But I couldn't find anything in the hardware monitor, the voltages were okay. I also hooked up my multimeter to the thing for a while just to keep tabs on the 12 volt rail, but it didn't dip below 12 volts at any point. Now it's time to install some drivers for this computer and I'm gonna be using a USB thumb drive for that. That's because the networking card isn't auto detected by Windows 98, so I don't have any other obvious means of getting drivers onto this computer. But now the problem is with a default Windows 98 installation that USB thumb drives aren't automatically supported. I mean, they are picked up by the computer, but you will see if you look into device manager that the USB disk here is not available. So we need to install a USB driver. And there is such a driver for Windows 98 that I usually keep 
keep on a disc, a three and a half inch uh, floppy disk. And then I just copy it over to the computer, install it. And then upon a restart, I should be able to use my USB thumb drive just by uh, clicking on the USB disk here, clicking on the reinstall driver, and then Windows 98 should automatically pick it up and it will build its driver information database and then make the USB thumb drive available for us to use. One of the first thing I also like to install on a retro machine is 7-zip, allowing us to archive and unarchive files because a lot of the drivers will come to you under the form of archives. For example, the NVIDIA drivers here is a zip file containing the Windows 98 drivers which have support for this GeForce 200 Ti. So I'm gonna be using this one because if you're dealing with a video card which is newer than the platform which is it's running on, you typically want to go with the lowest driver versions possible because NVIDIA, for example, is known for putting a lot of stress on the CPU on higher version drivers, and that's not something that you want to have on a Pentium 3-based system. This is basically just a Windows 98 setup program, next, 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 finish. And after a reboot, we should see a very colorful Windows 98 desktop. This is looking already a lot better. The next thing I want to install is the networking card from Realtek. So like I said, excellent Windows 98 support, setup program, next, 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 finish, and we should be good to go. Now, Windows will often prompt you to restart your computer. That's not always necessary. For example, here, I am going to enable file and print sharing on this computer before I restart it, because otherwise you can just keep on restarting Windows 98 for the smallest change that you do on the operating system. Audio support is coming to us via these creative uh, Sound Blaster drivers. So this is the Sound Blaster Audio PCI, has this little setup program, but yeah, pretty straightforward. And after that, we should be able to hear some music. One final thing that I want to install is the Intel chipset software for the Intel 440BX chipset here. And after installing this after a restart, Windows 98 will update some key components here, giving us a system which is now ready to do some retro gaming on. So yeah, just a quick check here in Device Manager. Let's see what we have. So we have USB support, that's great. All of our system devices are installed for the Intel 440 chipset. We have our storage devices. We have sound with the Creative Audio PCI. We have the hard disk controller. Our networking adapter is installed and our GeForce 2 Ti display adapter is recognized. So yeah, everything is looking good. Now, one of the first pieces of software that I'm going to run on this PC is 3 Mark 99 Max, because I want to see how this GeForce 2 Ti will perform on this Pentium 2 clocked at 500 megahertz. So I'm going to change the display properties here to have it run at 640 by 480. And I'm just going to run the benchmark and see what we come up with. I like looking at these two first benchmarks here. The race is looking really well. We get pretty high FPS above 40. So yeah, this is looking really good. So yeah, the next benchmark that we have here is the first person. This is a little bit more demanding than the first one. So let's see how this one turns out. And yeah, it's looking really good again above 40 FPS easily. So yeah. So yeah, this is obviously more of a high end video card. I mean, in a lot of these Pentium 2, Pentium 3 based systems, you see these kind of low end cards and they make a really significant difference in terms of this type of benchmarking. So let's take a look at the overall score with this GeForce 2 Ti and we end up with a 3D Mark score of 4,592 with the CPU 3D Mark of 7,800. 
Now that's an impressive score if you ask me. And of course a lot of it is to do with the fact that you have this TI version installed in your computer, which is not something that everybody has. I mean probably if you have a Pentium 2 or a Pentium 3, you probably have something like an ATI 3D Rage Pro Turbo or some other crappy video card. So let's take a look at what kind of benchmarking results you would get with the ATI card versus the uh, GeForce TI card. And we'll look at some gameplay later on also. So let's fire up 3D Mark first. We have our ATI card installed, which is recognized as an expert at work. So we'll start the race benchmark here. And as you can see, I mean, the frame rate is pretty much dropped to half. We're getting around 20 FPS on this first benchmark. And the first person benchmark also, you know, hovers around the 20 FPS mark. So yeah, definitely performance cut in half uh, as uh, compared to the TI uh, GeForce. And as you can see here, we get an overall score of 1900 3D marks compared to the 4600 we got with the GeForce TI. And when you compare the two benchmarks here, you can really see big differences in the various tests which are being uh, executed here. So the fill rate, for example, is, I mean, it pales in comparison with the GeForce 2 TI here. But now what does that mean in terms of gameplay when you have a Pentium 3 500 megahertz with a crappy ATI card? Well, you will be able to play some of the early games without any problems. I mean, Colin McRae Rally, stuff like that runs really smooth on the Pentium 3 500. I mean, the ATI card is a pretty compatible card. The Pentium 3 500 is a really nice retro platform. You can play stuff like Quake without uh, too many issues. It will run pretty fast. There were a couple of driver glitches, but overall performance wasn't all that bad. I mean, it was definitely playable at the lower resolutions. Same goes for Midtown Madness. I mean, if you stick to the lower resolutions and the medium to low settings, you will be able to get somewhere around 20 frames per second. Quake 2 is still a game which is definitely playable on a setup like this. You will get around 20 FPS. But as soon as you hit, for example, Quake 3 Arena and you get on the more complicated maps, then you will see that performance will drop considerably. But hey, I mean, there are plenty of, you know, earlier games that will run really well. Just look at Motor Racer here, for example, which is running very smoothly on the ATI card. Other games like Need for Speed 3, for example, they did have some glitches with the ATI card, but again, definitely playable. You're hitting around somewhere around 20 FPS. But if you feel like playing a little bit of an Unreal Tournament on the ATI, then you're in for a world of pain as you will not be able to achieve anything over 15 frames per second, which is not ideal if you want to frag your friends. So what do you do? I mean, you can't just go out and buy yourself a GeForce 2 TI card because they are pretty expensive for a build like this. And obviously, you know, you can't stick with the ATI card either because there are definitely a lot better options out there. So what should you be looking out for? Well, in my personal opinion, you should just go for a GeForce 2 card, but just go for the MX version. I mean, these are dirt cheap. You can get these for like five euros. They're not as fast as the GeForce Ti, but they are considerably faster than the ATI card. You can get these all over the place. This is an MS8080-39 card, you can look it up on eBay, but it will give you really nice performance. Just look at Unreal Tournament here, where on the ATI card, we weren't able to manage over 15 FPS. Here we're getting 30 plus FPS easily. Also, when doing the Quake 3 benchmark on these complicated maps, we're getting 30, 40 frames per second, which is really, really good. You can also expect far fewer driver issues. Just look at the drive menu here from Need for Speed, which looked really awkward on the ATI, but looks flawlessly here on the GeForce 2 MX. And also when we look at the gameplay here, again, 30, 40 FPS, not an issue. And also Midtown Madness, 
20 30 fps without any issue even on high detail so definitely a big step up from the ati card now if we take a quick look at the four cards that we have tested here which is the ati 3d rage pro the geforce 200 ti i've also included the geforce mx 4000 which is a pretty common model and the mx 200 you can see that the ti uh, greatly outclasses all of the other ones the ATI card lags behind but the GeForce MX200 and the MX4000 are you know roughly uh, around the same performance point they're definitely somewhat slower than the GeForce 200 Ti but a lot faster than the ATI 3D Rage Pro So yeah, I have to say I'm mighty impressed with the performance of this little GeForce 2 MX card, especially combined with a Pentium 3 based system. I mean, you're getting a good retro PC capable of playing all of these great late 1990s games on this GeForce 2 card. Now, of course, if you ever get the chance to pick up a GeForce 2 Ti card like this one, or you find one in an old retro computer, I would definitely recommend using it. It's a really great card. You can play games in higher resolution and a lot more detail than you would be able to do so with the GeForce 2 MX but expect to pay a lot more than a GeForce 2 MX. I think these cards go easily for about 40, 50 euros, and that's just for the video card alone. So if you're on a 50 euro budget, then yeah, forget about it and go for the GeForce 2 MX. It will allow you to play a lot of the older games and a lot of the newer games as well. So yeah, that's it for me regarding this Pentium 3 500 megahertz build. I really hope you've enjoyed this one. So if you're looking for like a 50 euro retro PC, then you should be able to find something like a Pentium 3 based system. They are not super common, but you sometimes come across them. And I think 50 euros will get you a lot of retro computing fun on a system like this. As always, if you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already done so. And I hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye.